Hello and welcome to our nursing news you can use live at five with Baxter Professional Services and the Nurse Shark Academy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today is March the 8th, 2023, and I'm very excited to be here. Let's go ahead and get into it because we've got another heavy news day here in healthcare. Here's our affirmations for the day. Here's our first affirmation. The comeback is always stronger than the setback. The comeback is always stronger than the setback. I like that. Strength grows in the moments when you think you can't go on, but you keep going anyway. Strength grows in the moments when you think you can't go on, but you keep going anyway. And then lastly, don't tell people your plans, show them or show people your results. Don't tell people your plans, show people your results. So those are our affirmations for today. Uh, love it, love it, love it. Love the idea of showing those results. And we're going to talk about a way for you to do that um, at the end of this segment. So um, let's go ahead and move on. So there's a couple of things that are happening that I wanted to make sure that you uh, know, and I'm going to change some of that in the show notes uh, going on uh, for our upcoming events, but I'll be sure to share that information with you. So let's get on to our uh, What I Am Reading segment for our leadership moment. And I wanted to get some insights again from the One Minute Entrepreneur, the One Minute Entrepreneur by Ken Blanchard, Don Hudson, and Ethan Willis. Uh, this is uh, the chapter on catching the entrepreneurial bug. Uh, so here are some of these insights. I love this. He says, ambition is the fuel that can drive life-changing events. So let's take a moment and think about that. When you have that opportunity to dream big, the sky's the limit. There aren't any limitations. You can choose to do whatever it is that you want to do. It's that thought that can drive you to uh, those life-changing events because as you're moving forward and you're in that momentum, things begin to happen. He says, identify what you're passionate about doing. Look to do more of it. Don't be afraid to dream big. Don't quit your day job until you've got some success under your belt. And he says, if nobody will pay you to do what you love, you have a hobby and not a career. So I really like those insights from the One Minute Entrepreneur. So I thought I'd share those with you as we get started on our show today. So let's go ahead and get started with our first news segment. This is coming from the Indianapolis Star. This I found uh, interesting and maybe a little bit more disheartening. Uh, but it says, Ascension shuts down doctor's offices and invests in profitable hospitals. Uh, so uh, as we get into this, from the Indy Star, Vicki Ritter was counting on her doctors. She's been seen for around five years to care for her. She dealt with cancer and the after effects of a stroke. But the Ascension St. Vincent Clinic, five minutes away from her house in Frankfurt, a city of about 15,000, about 40 miles northwest of Indianapolis, is closing for good. Her doctors and the staff there were welcoming and made her feel comfortable and safe. Uh, Ritter says, uh, you you connect with them, they know your life. Ritter's just one of many rural residents who will face difficulties assessing health care amid recent closures from Ascension St. Vincent, the nonprofit health network that operates in Indiana and 18 other states. Ascension St. Vincent has closed nearly two dozen primary and walk-in urgent care centers across Indiana in the past year or so, creating pockets of care deserts across the state. Primary care, your local doctor's office, is critical for catching diseases and health problems early and managing chronic health problems before they develop into expensive hospital stays. Similarly, urgent care or walk-in clinics allow people with emergency problems to get cheaper care in a more convenient location. Emergency room visits are notoriously expensive and crowded. So when you look at this, and we've talked about this situation before, because they've just recently closed the urgent care center here in Anderson, where I live. Um, I've also seen a 
closure of physician offices in Anderson and Pendleton and other areas in Madison County. And so I want us in Madison County to pay attention to what's happening around us and noticing that some of these things are happening. I had this very conversation um, with my mother who uh, is in the process of looking for another primary care provider because her primary care providers uh, that she really loved, she got along with that were there for her and listened to her actually uh, were forced into retirement. So these are struggles that people are having all over the country. And so now this has hit home to Indiana. It says that Ascension St. Vincent is closing 11 facilities in central Indiana, citing pandemic challenges. The Health Network cited financial struggles for the decision, but the network is still putting hundreds of millions into hospital projects and has sunk billions into investments that didn't pan out. The financial decisions of the giant network are under scrutiny as it becomes one of the most dominant health providers in the state and responsible for entire communities in some cases. And so this is where some of those issues are coming up because the smaller regional hospitals that we used to have have gotten bought up by these conglomerate conglomerates. When they buy these hospitals then, now they also are buying a lot of these physician practices. And then when the physician practices are aren't as profitable as they would like them to be, they often look to close them. Uh, so this is coming from, uh, again, the article of the Indy Star. It says the health network in 2021 um, was putting uh, $325 million into expansions and renovations at its main hospital on 86th Street in Indianapolis. Last year, it announced it's building a smaller hospital near Purdue University. But that always hasn't been the case. Last year, it also closed down a hospital in Bedford, Indiana, a city of 14,000 people, despite community protests. So again, what we're seeing is this, this flight to more affluent suburban neighborhoods. So pulling this health care um, out of these uh, more rural areas to these less from these less profitable areas to the areas uh, where there's wealthier suburbs, it goes against the stated mission of nonprofit health networks providing care for all, regardless of the ability to pay. Uh, so the mission by Ascension said it's committed to serving all persons with special attention to those who are poor and vulnerable. And so there's other information. This Indie Star article is very good, and it's touching just the, the basis, because Ascension right now is also, as we reported previously from other stories, um, under investigation because of not meeting that charity care that they say is in their mission statement. Um, it says uh, that the Network's Indiana hospitals together are turning major prof profits, even the now closed Bedford Hospital. In 2022, the hospital in Bedford made 1.4 million more than it spent on operating the facility. Um, Ascension's main hospital, 86th Street, made 190 million that year. In fact, Ascension, which is headquartered in St. Louis, makes more money out of Indiana than any of the other 18 states where it operates. And it says that's despite having uh, more or similar numbers of patients in other states. So others are saying, you know, why is this? And it, it, this, is, this is what I'm interested in. It says outpatient hospital doctor costs in Indiana are low compared to other states, ranking its 47th according to Sage Transparency, but Indiana charges the fourth most for inpatient care. That's because Indiana has large consolidated networks that can dem demand high charges from insurance companies who don't have many other options. So that's, that's the other thing that's coming out. Hospitals in the state charge some of the highest fees in the country further driving up the price according to California-based RAND Corporation. So this is uh, research that uh, Indy Star has put out here. So this I find interesting. 
Um, it goes on to say that the Ascension National Network lost a whopping 1.2 billion. Yes, I'm going to say that again, 1.2 billion. And remember, I said this a few months ago when that first came out that they Ascension lost this money. That we're going to start seeing changes in how healthcare is provided uh, through there. I sounded that bell a long time ago and now we're seeing this um, and so they lost 1.2 billion in 2022 while making profits from its network indiana hospitals other health systems like iu health and community health networks also lost hundreds of millions to a billion dollars in investments he said, these are nonprofits. They should be investing that profit in Indiana and supporting these communities, not taking this money and putting it on Wall Street. So that's where some of those issues are coming. You remember 2022 was very rough in the market. So if you've made investments in the market, your investments are down. Now, obviously, you know, the market swings up and down. But that's where part of that problem is, is that now we're taking that uh, that loss and the, who's taking the hit, it's patient care. Um, this is according to um, someone who says uh, that it's increasingly common for nonprofits to make significant money off of investments. And when they lose money, they have to make tough operating decisions. And so again, that means patient care. The increasingly consolidated healthcare industry in Indiana, which also includes Indiana University and Community Health Network, are run more like big business than nonprofit charities, according to hospital finance experts. They have massive reserves with enough cash to run the entire system for months to more than a year. Many make investments to build up a war chest to compete, to compete for patients by investing in expanding profitable services and acquiring smaller providers and even health systems. So Crawfordsville, where Ascension St. Vincent recently closed their primary care office, was also experiencing shrinking numbers of providers in their Franciscan health centers. One of the immediate care centers that Ascension closed last June was also located in Crawfordsville. This loss left the city of just over 16,000 in Western Indiana without any after hours medical care short of the emergency room. So you can see that this is a dire situation and it's not just affecting um, one hospital system but as you can see those dominoes will begin to fall so we'll keep it we'll keep an eye on what's happening with this situation and I'll let you know so that's why i say tune into the show every week because things happen so fast and uh, i know it's difficult to keep up with everything and sometimes it's disheartening but if you know you can make better decisions you can be empowered you can go to these meetings and talk to your legislators and say we want something done you can go uh, up there and talk to and write letters to these places and let them know you want something done. So be an informed citizen and look out for uh, some of these things that are happening. So uh, I want to go on to this other um, article. The I found I just I just happened upon this article and haven't had a chance to really review everything on it. And I will caveat this that this is an opinion. Okay, so this is from the Hill. This is an opinion. It is not uh, endorsed by the Hill. But I find this interesting because of the research that's coming out and it's things that we are looking at in the long term care industry. So it says the scandalous effects of nursing home isolation during COVID-19. So according to this, it says with the pandemic state of emergency coming to a close and with flu season now flu and COVID-19 season, experts are shifting their focus to what we can learn from the experience and to apply future public health challenges. COVID's tragic and devastating effects on nursing home residents have been well documented, but the time has come for an impartial look at the full effect of the measures implemented to reduce the impact of the virus. New academic research includes data showing that for vulnerable nursing home populations, the response to the pandemic may have been even deadlier than the virus itself. And so we're seeing some reports coming out, and I certainly... I was with a panel that talked about the social isolation that can happen um, because of the pandemic, other things that you're happen, that happens to you um, when you're in the nursing home. So this is interesting. So it says, um, 
in 2020, policymakers and health professionals understandably took far-reaching steps to slow this virus' spread. Nowhere were these social distancing measures more disruptive or drastic than in nursing homes. Residents were separated from their spouses and children, and many weren't allowed to leave their rooms to socialize with other residents. And as someone who was taking care of someone in a nursing home, uh, that was certainly true. I remember uh, during the pandemic standing outside her room on her birthday with her gift, waving at her through the window and talking to her on the phone. And the nurse had to come and get her gift and bring it to her. Um, nearly everyone understood that being able to see friends and family is essential for quality of life and that even short-term isolation would come into significant consequences. Now, again, this is research that we have done in the past to know that social isolation is one of the big risk factors for decline in older adults. However, we had to weigh the risks and the benefits. Many younger Americans who lost their jobs, worked from home, or saw their interests and hobbies shut down suffer from loneliness and depression, which is certainly true. We've often seen that rise in things with uh, young people who weren't able to socialize as well and weren't able to fully participate in those rites of pass passages, such as graduation ceremonies, proms, and things like that. So it says the response to the pandemic failed to account for the fact that isolation at nursing homes was far more extreme than what most people experience. Loneliness is serious, especially among older adults for whom social interaction, mental acuity, and physical health are deeply entwined. By some estimates, estimations, social isolation increases mortality by over 25%, and the effects of such extreme isolation on nursing home residents may be even larger. So there is a further research that's coming out of this, and so this uh, opinion piece is bringing that to the forefront, and we're going to certainly be watching what happens uh, to say that. And so again, they're not saying that no response to COVID-19, you know, you know, having no response was warranted, you know, we had to do something. We had to keep them safe. We had to keep each other safe. Um, and, and nursing homes do, you know, when they have really bad flu seasons or there's a flu going around, they will restrict visitation. And, and that's, it makes sense. And then we had the social distancing though, um, that even when the measures were lifted, um, you know, maybe we can look at how more effectively we can do that. I remember her telling me, well, we, you know, I don't get a chance to go to activities anymore because we have to eat in our rooms. And um, so when I visited her, I'm like, why are you lying in bed? She was always in bed. Like, you know, you need to get up, get up, move around. I don't care if you just walk around the room, but you need to get up more. And so I think we're seeing some of that. So it's going to be interesting to find out what further uh, research will be out there, but I wanted to bring that up to the forefront because we need to start thinking smarter um, and how we're going to come in response to this so we'd be better prepared. All right. Let's look at our next. Oh, yeah. Let me let me get to this. Let me get to this and then we'll get to this. This is something that, again, from the Indie Star, uh, that's coming. This is hitting close to home today, so this is why I want to bring this out. But um, this I found very interesting because it says delays at Indiana licensing agency cost job and care opportunities, and because it's affecting mental health, which is an area in which I work. This is why I was really interested in this article, and it says Mary Moore. Uh, waited nearly five months for her temporary license to provide mental health care in Indiana, forcing her to turn down multiple job offers while making ends meet as a single mom. She told the Indy Star she called every morning and was told she was in line to be reviewed. What was supposed to be a four to six week processing time dragged into months. She finally received her temporary license on January the 23rd, around the time Indy Star inquired uh, the Indiana Professional License Agency about pending applications for mental health counselors. But when she received her, her license, most of her classmates were still waiting. She says there's no organization, no rhyme or reason. It's a mess. And having had to contact the professional licensing agency, I have to say that I agree. Um, I was working with a, a 
a, a, a client and she was we were inquiring about massage therapy and licensure and things like that i basically was given the runaround we were reading <laughs> we read to them what the statute says right uh and the regulations unfortunately it didn't appear that they were actually following said regulations because when i asked who the people were that were supposed to be on the panel it was like uh mm, uh and I, I'm like, so there should be a better way for us to establish what we need to do for on these different professions. And so I bring that up because it's not just um, mental health workers, but it's nurses, it's doctors, it's physical therapists. It's it, it, because they do the licensing for basically the whole state. Uh, so mental health and physical health providers uh, who share Moore's experiences with the agency said that delays cost them job opportunities and kept them from providing much needed care to patients. Many said they were constantly on hold, had to resubmit information the agency lost, were unable to connect with the agency or get information about their application. The agency, which processes nearly 300 different types of professional licenses, said its employees issue licenses for behavioral health applications within three to 10 days on average. Okay. But um, delays typically are a, a result of application mistakes, they say. Okay. But the agency, which has been working on improving its processing times, may be getting some prodding from lawmakers. So there are several bills, which is why I brought this up, several bills in the Indiana General Assembly addressing licensing problems, um, including House Bill 1179, which aims to make it easier for professionals to get licensing without long delays. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So this is a case of Miranda Ferris, a nurse practitioner in DeMont, Indiana, waited nearly a year. Wait a minute. Yes, that is correct. A year. And I thought I having to wait about, it was about three months before I could get full licensure. And, and it was a, a lot of things that were happening. This is, of course, several years ago. But a year? She waited a year for her license to prescribe controlled substances and lost a job offer that paid $120,000 with benefits at Northwest Health, previous, previously known as Porter Regional Hospital. It was a golden contract, just golden, she said. She accepted the offer in June of 2021, expecting that it may take a few months to get her license required for the job, which allowed her to prescribe regulated medications. But when the license was still pending by December, the hospital moved on. So instead, Ferris worked at a private practice where she had the office manager and doctor also call into the agency. She says the office manager called multiple times. She faxed, I emailed, I called, I sent physical mail. She remembers hours of her days lost on hold, including twice when she was transferred to the cosmetology department after waiting on hold for nearly three hours. She said all they had to do was change the address. Between the three of us, we called 50 to 75 times, emailed and mailed, sent in every form available to change it. And the Indie Star went on to say that it's pretty uh, common for Hoosiers to raise alarms about unresponsive and oftentimes understaffed Indiana agencies. And I've certainly have seen that working with people who are applying for benefits such as Medicaid, uh, disability, SSI, all those different things, that there's such a big backlog. And then add on to that, we had the pandemic. And so during the pandemic, the unemployment office had a backlog so massive that some waited a year or more for benefits. And I certainly have seen that. An Indy Star investigation revealed that Indiana's worker safety office, understaffed and underfunded, ignored the vast majority of Hoosiers who asked the agency to intervene. And so there are a lot of hurdles that come into being in the uh, 
doing this. So uh, in 2021, the Professional Licensing Board sought to improve the delays that can drag on for months, a, a high number of unprocessed applications, poor customer support, a high staff turnover and processing errors, according to a law blog by Ronnie Miller, a lawyer who attended the December meeting and works for a firm that represents professionals who need licensing. So again, this is, these are things that are happening. I wanted to bring that up. So those of you, those nursing students that are coming out of school, be persistent. Be persistent. That's all I have to say. All right. So then let's move on to this because I want to kind of stay in Indiana for a minute. This next story, again, from the Indy Star. It was an op-ed that was published by Lakimba de Salder. Um, and so this is interesting because this is something we've covered and talked about before. And it says too many women, particularly black women are dying during childbirth in Indiana. And we covered this, the sad story of Dr. Uh, Shanice Wallace, a pediatric chief resident at the Indiana University School of Medicine who died during childbirth. Wallace developed preeclampsia, a pregnancy complication involving high blood pressure, more common among black women. The most recent maternal mortality report by the Indiana Department of Health released in late September of last year shows another 92 women died during pregnancy or up to a year after giving birth. Wallace's death became the symbol for the discrepancy in maternal health for pregnant people of color in Indiana. Our rates are at least 2.5 times higher in black women than white women. This discrepancy hold across all income levels. Let me say this again. This discrepancy hold across all income levels. According to a new study, wealthy mothers and their newborns in the United States are the most likely to survive the year after childbirth, except when the family is black. In fact, the New York Times points out that the richest black mothers and their babies are twice as likely to die as the richest, richest white mothers and their babies. Childbirth poses a real risk for black women in Indiana. As the celebration of Black History Month comes to an end, there remains an overwhelming reality that black women who are pregnant are at risk as well as their unborn child. And so these are questions that you know we have to ask how can we move forward? And so um, the author says, let's serve as, this, as a reminder to elected officials for black Hoosiers, a positive pregnancy test call can all too often lead to poor outcomes. And as we have witnessed to a necessary death, the oath serve and protect should be a reminder to all of us of the power our legislators have to keep all of us safe and healthy. This is a commitment that cannot continue to be ignored due to Indiana's rapidly growing maternal health crisis. By not making changes, this legislature neglects our most vulnerable Hoosiers and is abandoning this very sacred oath. And certainly this is one of those initiatives that we are going to be watching. Um, maternal health is one really big but then this brings up the question i have what happens if you live in one of these rural communities where your only doctor's office is now closed how are you going to get access to the health that you need where the urgent care where you could have gone in to have them check your blood pressure is now closed See, this is this is more than just me reporting these stories. This is for me, for you to get an opportunity to think about how what's happening in our state affects us individually in our care. And so this is why I brought this article here, uh, certainly to point out that the mortality rate for black moms is horrible. But the other thing is, when you think about what can we do about it when you already have a system that's fragile with lack of nursing staff, uh, now hospitals closing and doctor's office closing, no primary care providers there. This is beginning to snowball and we're going to start seeing more health crises in uh, Indiana unless we do something about it. And that's why I'm bringing these stories out. Okay, let's get to this. Let's move on. 
and we're going to talk about another state. This is coming from um, uh, Washington from king5.com, and it says a uh, state, uh, SB. 5236 and SB 5582 aimed to address nursing shortage in Washington. Um, I brought this out because I want to see what other places in the country are doing to address their nursing shortage. And so uh, Senate Bill 5236 passed on Monday and heads to the House for approval. The legislation has three major parts, requiring hospitals to create staffing plans with input from a committee made up of nurses and administrators. First of all, I'm going to applaud that. <laughs> they put the nurses on the committee. If anybody you know, that's huge. Because a lot of times uh, they have people making the decisions, but the frontline staff is not involved. So kudos on that part. Uh, requiring um, uh, re reinforce a law regarding meals and breaks. <sighs> yes, let the nurses go to the bathroom and eat. How hard is that? And giving the Department of Labor and Industries a greater role in investigating complaints alongside the Department of Health. Because I have to say, sometimes the Department of Health, like you know, if they're like in Indiana, they don't have enough staff to do all the things they need to do. And yeah, things fall through the cracks. And I don't put the blame solely on the Department of Health because they have to be properly funded, they have to have enough staff, and they have to have the right staff in place. Sometimes um, staff may not uh, be aware of some of the things that they need to look for. So I think that that's great. Maybe that will help them and maybe boost through it what they can do. Give the Department of Health a, hel a helping hand. Uh, Senate Bill 5582 was passed unanimously in the Senate on Monday and heads to the House of Representatives for approval. The bipartisan bill hopes to address the mounting nursing shortage statewide by expanding educational opportunities and reducing barriers. So it doesn't exactly say how. Let me see here. Um, it says the proposal would create a pilot project that allows high school students in training to become certified nursing assistants and understaffed rural hospitals. Well, that's a great idea. And maybe that's something that we can implement right here in Anderson as to beef up those training programs that they have um, so that we can fill the pipeline. Unfortunately, though, um, I don't know if there's the the will to implement this. Um, it also says it would direct the State Board of Community and Technical College to develop a plan to train more nurses in the next four years. The legislation indicated indicates that the plan must prioritize expanding or creating programs that increase capacity to train nurses at the Bachelor of Nursing level, expand training opportunities for rural and underserved communities, and partnership with four-year universities. So here's part of the problem, though, because here in Indiana, how are they going to get to the clinical sites? Because they're closing the hospitals down and the doctor's office. Where are you going to put the students that you want to train? And so those are some real issues that are open because right now there's such a shortage of clinical sites in Indiana. It's really hard to get students in to get the proper training that they need. And this is not just Indiana, it's going across the country. So we're really going to have to be innovative and think about how we're going to do this. Here's another uh, article. Uh, that talks about what's happening in another state, and this happens to be in Florida, and this is from the Tampa Bay Times, and it says suing Florida nursing homes for wrongful death will get harder if this bill passes. A new bill would make it harder to sue Florida nursing homes and other long-term care facilities after the death of a resident. This is why I was really interested because of some of the wording that they have in these bills. So according to this, House Bill 1029 and with its companion, Senate Bill 1304. Oh, so by the way, those are my friends that are in Florida. You might want to pay attention to this story. You know, I'll be seeing some of you this evening, but uh, via Zoom. But hey, you might want to pay attention to this story and perk up if you're in Florida. So it says, if passed, only spouses and surviving children under 25. Now, first of all, okay, let's say you had a surviving child under the under the age of 25. 
let's just for argument's sake, let's say they're 14. What 14 year old is going to be able to hire an attorney? I'm just saying. But anyway, let's go on. It says, if passed, only spouses and surviving children under 25 would be able to file wrongful death suits against long-term care facilities in the Sunshine State. The proposed legislation comes as Republican lawmakers renew their annual push to shield businesses from costly lawsuits aimed at curbing what Re Governor Ron DeSantis has called a, a cottage industry of litigation. There is little data on the prevalence of frivolous lawsuits against long-term care homes in Florida, the experts say. Proponents say excessive lawsuits are rampant and the cost of defending them diverts resources from resident care. Opponents say that the legislation, particularly its wrongful death provision, takes away a tool for families to hold facilities accountable. Representative Randy Maggard, a Republican from Dade City, and Senator Colleen Burton, Republican from Lakeland, the bill's respective sponsors did not respond to requests for comment. Lawsuits against long-term care facilities nationally have grown more expensive to settle in recent years, several studies in the industry's liability claim costs suggest. At the same time, Florida has seen a spike in serious violation in, in its nursing homes, according to state citation data. Currently in Florida, spouses and surviving children of any age can file a lawsuit against that long-term care home is responsible for the resident's death. I think that that's horrible because that would leave someone who is widowed with a child who's 30 unable to get anything. So when does it? When do they stop being your mom and you and you care for them and love them? And in fact, I think that as you get older, obviously you're gonna and they get older, you're gonna be caring for them even more. So yeah, I kind of I understand the intent um, behind it, but I think it's a little bit short sighted. We're gonna watch this bill because I don't want it to come to other other countries, other countries, other states, um, so that people can get their justice when they need it. Um, I think that's kind of the wrong way of addressing a, a dire issue, which by the way, I think that we probably need to do a better job of supporting nursing homes and helping them get the adequate staff that they need. Uh, I think that would go a long way to reducing your malpractice issues and claims. But anyway, I digress. Uh, this is another bill. Uh, that's coming out of this is like legislation day I think um, from the heraldbanner.com and it says bill aims to remove nurse practitioner barriers and this is from the great state of Texas so in Austin, about 90% of Texas is experiencing a shortage of primary care health providers. A bill by Senator, State Senator Cesar Blanco, Democrat of El Paso, looks to change that. Senate Bill 1700, also known as the Health Care Expanded and Access Locally for Texans, or HEAL Texas Act, aims to address workforce shortages in the health care industry by reducing barriers among nurse practitioners. Blanco said our state is facing a health care crisis and fewer and fewer physicians are practicing in rural and underserved areas. Nurse practitioners are often the only health care providers in rural parts of the state, but they face two barriers. First, they are required to practice under a dele delegator physician, a physician who oversees the decisions made by the nurse practitioner. Second, the, those delegator physicians can charge up to $50,000 a year for their service without being required to physically meet patients in the community. So again, I've said it before, this is you pay this doctor to sign something after the fact and he've never met you, talked to you, don't know anything about you. All they want to be paid for is their signature. Okay. And yes, if I've been called this before, so I've had some people call me biased, I'm going to say yes, I'm biased. Okay, I will admit my bias there because I think it's not making sense. And if we want to cut the, the overspending in healthcare, this is one of the ways to do that is because now we don't have those artificial barriers uh, for practice. 
I think there should be some common sense measures and everybody works together. Nobody works in a vacuum. And, and so I think that we have to use some common sense here. But I digress. Blanco said removing the delegator physician barrier would encourage more nurse practitioners to stay in small communities without being priced out. The bill also allows nurse practitioners to practice to the full extent of their professional ability as 26 other states in the United States already do. This bill is not about doctors. This bill is not about nurses, Blanco said. This bill is about Texans getting the quality care that they need. We can deliver better access we can deliver better options by passing Heal Texas. And so we'll keep an eye on what's happening. As President Cindy Weston of the Texas Nurse Practitioners uh, said, a praise the bill calling it bold and common sense, which is exactly what I said. Removing outdated regulations will allow highly skilled nurse practitioners to step into our state's healthcare shortage areas and provide much needed care to more Texans. 26 other states, all branches of the United uh, States military, the United States Department of Veteran Affairs, already allows nurse practitioners to practice to the full extent of their training and licensing. It's time Texas did the same. And might I add, it's time that Indiana do the same as well. Um, again, this is not about making it so nurse practitioners can do crazy things, you know, they're outside of our scope. We're not looking to expand the scope of practice. We just want to be able to work within it without artificial barriers that are in place that no longer make sense. It doesn't make sense. And so that's my that's my point, my two cents on that. I'm going to move on because we're getting short on our time. And I want to make sure I get to the good stuff, the good, good. Okay. So... All right, so let's go to this uh, article here. This is from uh, American Medicine Association, the ANA, and it announces 2023 ANA Innovation Awards winners improving healthcare delivery to be more practical, comfortable, and patient-centered. And I wanted to congratulate these nurses on their um, efforts and making a difference. So we have... Um, Winners of the Nurse-Led Team Award, Roxanne McMurray and the McMurray team. Roxanne McMurray is a nurse anesthetist. She leads a team that developed the distal pharyngeal airway, or DPA, called the McMurray Enhanced Airway, which is a breathing tool that stents open throat issues to maintain adequate ventilation for surgery and other medical procedures. Can I just stop here to say... I want you to listen to this. This is a doctorally prepared nurse inventing something to be used in surgery. So I want you to hear that and think through those things because I think in the public's mind, there are just certain things that only doctors can do and certain things only nurses can do. But yet, as a nurse, you have so much that you also participate in those procedures. The doctors do not do this on their own. They don't do it alone. And so I'm saying that because I want you to understand the impact that nurses can make in the marketplace and what they can do to help patient care. So McMurray and her team saw a gap in available and effective airway management tools for populations who suffer from breathing complications, which led to the creation of DPA. This tool is the first of its kind and designed to keep patients breathing who are susceptible to upper airway obstruction during sedation or unconscious, which is a common occurrence with potentially serious outcomes. So congratulations. Uh, winner of the Individual Nurse Award goes to Kevin Lee Smith. Uh, Kevin Lee Smith, a nurse practitioner, is the creative mind behind The Good Clinic, a Minnesota-based modern primary care model that provides patients age 12 or older with holistic wellness plans tailored to each individual's health goals and lifestyle while offering convenience, value, and accessibility. This pioneering healthcare model is strategically led by nurse practitioners who utilize their unique relationship with patients, referred to as clients, to fully understand their health background and to thoughtfully collaborate on personalized healthcare recommendations such as wellness programs and family 
practice services. The Good Clinic offers same day, next day, and virtual care appointments and accepts most insurances. Clients have described the Good Clinic as spa-like and not your typical doctor's office. Every Good Clinic includes a retail component featuring essential oils, nutritional supplements, and books on healthy diet and lifestyle. So again, this is great. These are nurses that are doing such big things out there, and I applaud them. These are nurses making a difference. Uh, so those are those two nurses I wanted to highlight for this segment. And then we have... Um, oh, I want to get us to a uh, health system. This is health system making a difference. This is coming back from good old Indiana. Good Samaritan announces virtual nursing for patients um, in Vincennes, Indiana. Good Samaritan is now able to offer patients live virtual visits thanks to Banyan Medical Security. Uh, solutions. As of Tuesday, Good Samaritan is combating the issue of the nursing labor shortage and burnout during a time of high patient demand with patient-centered virtual nursing. Working to supplement the on-site patient care team, Good Samaritan will be able to add four additional nurses through the new virtual system. Rachel Spalding, Good Samaritan's chief nursing officer, said that the that Good Samaritan will have a nursing team dedicated to them through Banyan to provide virtual care services. These registered nurses who have all gone through a hospital orientation and training procedures will become an extension of our Good Samaritan nursing team. With having a dedicated Brian team assess, assigned to us, our nurses and the virtual nurses will become familiar with one another and working as one team. The focus of the virtual nursing program is to provide assistance to Good Samaritan's on-site nursing teams. Spalding also noted that the virtual nurses will complete admission and discharge paperwork along with their patient education. This allows our nurses to spend more time on one-to-one -one delivering direct care to our patients. This is a, a will be a game changer for our care delivery model. Quality of care is our number one priority in Banyan enhances that commitment. Our partnership with Banyan will also help us maintain and energize staff nurses. So the vertical platform has been licensed in all 50 states, improved clinical areas that cover patient experience and outcomes, time spent at bedsides, call light response times, as well as nurse turnover over time and operational costs. Uh, Banyan's new system has also decreased the length of stay uh, in, uh, in readmission. So again, I think that's great. We'll see what happens with that. Um, so hopefully there'll, there'll be great outcomes and it'd be great to follow that, but at least they're thinking um, outside the box and being innovative. And then our last uh, nurse making a difference. This is coming from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And they uh, put out a uh, uh, press release, Nurse Innovator Awarded Fulbright to Develop International Program with University in Scotland. Professor Karen K. Uh, Giolano, co-director of the Elaine Maribeb Center for Nursing and Engineering Innovation, has received a Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program Award in Nursing and Public Health Care for 2023 to 2024 academic year. Giuliano who holds a joint appointment in the Elaine Marib, 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 there we go, Marib College of Nursing and the Institute for Applied Life Sciences will spend six months as visiting research professor at the Edinburgh Napier University School, which is the largest school of its kind in Scotland. As the nation's largest health largest group of healthcare providers, nurses use more products and are a part of more services than any other healthcare professionals, providing them with a unique, practically practical and care sensitive perspective on healthcare innovations, according to Giuliano. She is a critical care nurse and medical device developer. So with her ENU partner, Allison Porter Armstrong, Giuliano will work on curriculum development to provide frontline clinicians with the skills to become healthcare innovation leaders. The resulting international program jointly delivered by UMass Amherst and ENU will include an option for international field work to support students with real world experiential learning. 
So this is great. And so I wanted to say congratulations to Giuliano and her partners for being a nurse, making a difference. And that ends our news segment for today. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening. I'm going to update the show notes in a bit, but I wanted to really put out here that coming up on March the 29th at three o'clock on LinkedIn, and on our Nurse Shark Academy Facebook page, we will be having our um, Nurse Shark Academy Financial Freedom Workshop. We already have several people that are planning to attend on LinkedIn. Uh, so we'll be live streaming this event. Uh, and there will be uh, no um, replay um, because I will leave the videos up shortly and then we'll take them down uh, shortly. I'll leave them for like 24 hours after the event and then I'm going to be planning on taking them down. So I wanted to let you know that that's coming up. This is to help answer those myths that we have as nurses that we can't, we don't, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, and we don't have the uh, the skill set to be entrepreneurs. We're going to bust all those three myths for you. We're going to talk about that. We're definitely going to hit that that uh, money factor because I want to talk about how you can get your business funded um, and, and get the funding to do your own business in a variety of different ways and not and i want to say it's not a one size fits all situation there are a lot of people who won't uh who will want to go one way or the other and so we'll talk about those ways about how you get started in launching your business and i can tell you from personal experience that yes you can start your own business so i encourage you to join us for that that's the end of the month March 29th starts at 3 o'clock. You can uh, register on LinkedIn. You can also uh, register on our Facebook page, or you can go to the Nurse Shark Academy uh, website page. And if you sign up there, we'll have a Zoom available as well. So uh, we'll be live streaming that um, to for that event. So I encourage you to hop in. All right, that's it for now. I want to say goodbye. Thank you for being with us. Don't forget to leave a comment like share our videos uh please let people know because i want to give out great information to help to help our uh, healthcare workers and anyone who's watching about what's happening in healthcare and giving you the, nur the nursing news that you can use thank you and have a great day